I received a request to make a tutorial on how to use dual digit seven segment LED displays. This video will focus on the basics of LED displays and demonstrate how to interface them with the Raspberry Pi. LED displays are a cool way to provide simple, easy to read alphanumeric feedback. Each digit in a display is comprised of seven segments that are labeled from A to G in a clockwise fashion. Each letter segment is lit by an LED. For example, if I turn on LEDs A through C and leave the rest off, the display will show a seven. On a dual digit display, I can show 81 by turning on all the LEDs on the left digit and only B and C on the right. Examples of LED displays from my previous projects include this simple battery operated timer and my CNC joystick. Both of these projects are based on microcontrollers. When using a single board computer like the Raspberry Pi, there are a couple constraints. The first is the number of GPIO pins. A dual digit display has 14 LEDs, 16 if we're using the decimal points. Assigning a GPIO pin to each LED would not leave us with very much left over for other inputs and outputs. Second, the maximum current per pin on a GPIO is 16 milliamps. However, the total combined current you can source or sync is 50 milliamps. If you're driving an LED at 5 milliamps, you can only light up 10 before you risk damaging the Pi. These issues are addressed by multiplexing, which simply means to cycle power to the digits one at a time. The first digit is lit up for a very short amount of time, and then it goes off, and the next digit is lit. On a dual display, the power would just alternate between the two. If you do this fast enough, you have persistence of vision, and the human eye can't tell the difference. By multiplexing, we only need seven GPIO pins for the seven segments, plus one GPIO pin per digit to control either the common cathode or anode. When purchasing an LED display, you can choose between common anode, where all the LED anodes are connected together, or common cathode, where all the LED cathodes are connected. I'll start with a Kingbright DC04-11 LED display, which is a dual digit common cathode. It's a good match for the Pi because it's bright and energy efficient. First, I'll connect the corresponding lettered segments from the two digits together, A1 to A2, B1 to B2, etc. This is because each same letter segment will connect to a single GPIO pin. Then the common cathode pins will be used to alternate power to the individual digits. GPIO 10 through 16 are connected to segments A through G respectively. Using consecutively numbered pins will make the Python programming easier. A resistor is placed in series with each LED segment to throttle current. I'll start with 750 ohms, which should put me safely within the 50 milliamp limit. Later I can adjust the resistance down to optimize the brightness. The common cathodes are controlled with two NTE2361 high-speed MPN transistors. They're operated by GPIO 20 and 21, which are connected to the transistor bases in series with a 10K ohm resistor. The collectors are connected to the display cathodes and the emitters to ground. When GPIO 20 or 21 goes high, the transistor will sync the corresponding cathode and the digit will light up. We could emit the transistors and sync the cathodes directly to the GPIO pins, but then we'd be limited by the 16 milliamp limit per GPIO pin. The transistor raises the bar to 50 milliamps, although in practice I would try to leave a conservative buffer. On the breadboard I place the dual digit seven segment display. Instead of seven resistors, I prefer to use a single resistor network. This one is 750 ohm isolated, which is basically just the same as seven resistors, but in a 14 pin dip package. It's faster and easier to work with on the breadboard. You could just use seven resistors if you prefer. If you buy a resistor network, make sure you get the isolated ones. They also come in bust and dual terminator, which won't work. I connect the same letter segments from the two digits together. I'll start at the bottom with the C's, then the E's, the D's, on top the G's, the A's, the F's, and finally the B's. I'll connect the seven segments of the LED display to one side of the resistor network, from left to right, a to G. First A, then B, C, D, E, F, and G. The other side of the resistor network is temporarily connected to 3.3 volts provided by my bench power supply because I want to test the current draw before I connect the Pi and ensure I'm under 50 milliamps. Next, I'll connect the common cathodes of the display to the collectors of the two transistors. The emitters are already connected to the ground rail. I have a multimeter connected in series with the power supply so I can measure the current. Since we'll be multiplexing, I want to determine how much current a single digit will use if all the segments are illuminated. I add the two 10K ohm resistors to the transistor bases. Now when I take the base high, the transistor acts as a switch and the attached cathode goes low 
causing the current to flow and the digit lights up. You can see on the multimeter that this green LED display with a 750 ohm resistor is drawing about 11.34 milliamps. The other digit looks about the same. Different colors use different currents. If I swap the green for a blue, the current drops substantially to 5.73 milliamps. A red LED display increases the current to 12.74 milliamps. If I swap the 750 ohm resistor for a 220 ohm resistor, by the way, I shouldn't be using a screwdriver, something non-conductive would be better. Now the LED display is brighter, but our current jumps up to 30.66 milliamps. The blue only uses 12.8 milliamps with this resistor. A 100 ohm resistor is very bright and the current is a little over 18 milliamps. Here's a 50 ohm resistor. The current increases to around 22 milliamps. Switching back to red, and we're getting close to the 50 milliamp limit. The green is also high at around 44.9 milliamps. I like the blue and it uses the least current, so I'll stick with it. It's even a little too bright for my taste, so I'll increase the resistor back to 220 ohms. Now let's connect the Raspberry Pi. I'll remove the temporary patches. I start with connecting GPIO 10 to the bottom side of the 220 ohm resistor network at the first pin, which corresponds to segment A. Okay, it would help if I actually used GPIO 10. Quick fix here. The Pi is unplugged in case I make mistakes, like I just did. Next, GPIO 11 to B, 12 to C, 13 to D, 14 to E, 15 to F, and 16 to G. I hook up the ground rail to the Pi, the base of the transistor for the common cathode 1 to GPIO 20, and cathode 2 to GPIO 21, both in series with 10K ohm resistors. Okay, that's all it takes for the wiring. The timing requirements to multiplex are quite fast and need to be precise, otherwise the display will have a noticeable flicker. I've seen a couple Pi tutorials online where the Python sleep method is used to manage the timing. This is a bad approach because the sleep method is not reliable and it would put a substantial strain on the processor which has a lot of other things to juggle on a Pi. My solution is to use the Pi's DMA hardware. This will be very accurate, stable, and use very little CPU resources. DMA stands for Direct Memory Access. It is a module that can interact with the memory and peripherals autonomously of the CPU. It can operate the PWM module without it being interrupted by the Pi's OS. PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation. These pulses can be used for multiplexing. For this approach, we'll need the RPIO module. I'll install it using Python Setup Tools, which I install first with sudo apt-get install Python Setup Tools. Then I use sudo easy install u rpio. The RPIO module provides very simple methods to control PWM via DMA in Python. Once installation completes, I'll start idle using gksu because access to the GPIO pins requires super user privileges. I'll import sleep and PWM from the RPIO module that we just installed. Before using PWM, we must call the setup command and also initialize a channel. We'll be using channel 0. Next, I create a dictionary to translate integers to a list of LED segment patterns. The 1s represent lit segments and the zeros are unlit. For example, the number 0 would have all segments on except G, which is represented by a list of 6 1s followed by a 0. The number 1 has just two ones for segments B and C. I create another dictionary for pulse lengths. There are two states for the segments, LED off, which is 0, and LED on, which is 1. The dictionary will translate on to 999, which will be about 10 milliseconds, because the time is measured in 10 microsecond units. If you want to dim the display, you could lower this number. A shorter pulse means less brightness. I can set off to zero because I need some value to cancel any existing pulses. Four is the shortest value that I found to be stable. This will be 40 microseconds. A microsecond is one millionth of a second, so this will be too fast for the eye to see. Essentially, the segment will appear to be off. The PWM add channel pulse method is used to create the multiplexing for the two common cathodes. The first argument zero is the channel. The second is the GPIO pin 20, which is cathode one. The third is the start time, which will be zero. 
The last parameter is the pulse length. The default pulse cycle is 20 milliseconds, so this will be the first half. At channel pulse is used again for cathode 2 on GPO 21. This time we start at 1000 with the same length. This will be the second half of the cycle. My USB oscilloscope can better illustrate the multiplexing. When I start the pulse for common cathode 1, the display shows a square wave repeating every 20 milliseconds, which is low at 0 volts for 10 milliseconds, and then high at 3.3 volts for 10 milliseconds. When I add the pulse for common cathode 2, we get an offset wave that is opposite the first wave. Basically, the cathode swaps states every 10 milliseconds. The set dual 7 seg method will display a pass value on the LED display. The value parameter is converted to a string, and the map function is used with int to generate a list. For example, 38 would get converted to a list containing 3 and 8, 7 would get converted to a list containing 0 and 7. Next, a loop is used to add 7 pulses for each LED segment on both digits. 10 plus i corresponds to the GPIO pin of the segment. This is why I chose consecutive GPIO pins. If you're using an older Pi that doesn't have seven successive BCM GPIO pins, then you can use a Python dictionary to translate 0 to 6 to any seven GPIO pins you select. Then just replace 10 plus i with your dictionary element i. 0 matches the start time of the first digit cathode pulse. The length calculation is a little tough to read, but the code in this loop needs to be terse because the timing is critical. Digit 0 gets the value of the first digit. Num returns the bit pattern for the value, and it's indexed to the appropriate segment. Then pulse returns a length, which will determine if the segment gets lit up. The second add channel pulse statement adds the next digit. 1000 offsets the pulse to match the common cathode 2, and this time we specify the next digit. We end the code with some house cleaning, clear channel 0, and run the PWM cleanup method. To test the code, I'll call the set dual 7 seg method with 38. Okay, our display shows 38. Looks like everything's working. Next, I'll paste in a loop which will count to 100 and repeat. Set dual 7 seg will display the current loop value on the display. Now we have a simple counter. It's a little hard to tell on the video, but the digits are bright blue and flicker free. I'll end the video here. This will be part one. In the next episode, I'll explore using I2C LED display driver chips. These two wire ICs facilitate implementation because they handle the multiplexing, the current regulation, and have built-in registers to handle brightness and font libraries. I'll also fill another request by displaying the results from a DHT22 temperature humidity sensor on an LED display. I hope you found this video helpful. Feel free to make requests. You can support this channel by subscribing or leaving a like. Thanks for watching and check out my website, rototron.info.